thanks to Notion and my patrons over on Patreon for sponsoring this video. I also just wanted to say here because I feel like it's pretty apt in a video about queer teen media. Um, I wrote a book for queer teens that's coming out later this month called Here and Queer, A Queer Girl's Guide to Life. It's pretty much what it sounds like. I will leave information in the description as to how to pre-order and also get a signed book plate. It covers everything from like finding queer friends and community to coming out or not, dating, relationships, activism, representation, lots of different stuff. It's got very cute illustrations. Um, so yeah, maybe check it out. When I was in school, I remember sneaking around my friend's house to watch Queer as Folk, sat on the sofa as we binge watched episodes while we were meant to be doing homework. The show aired in the early 2000s and was known for graphic sex scenes, storylines on controversial topics like drug abuse and sex work, and a violent gay bashing that left a teenage Lee character brain damaged. And I was absolutely not the recommended age of 18 when I watched that show. Watching it wasn't about the stereotypical titillation of like teenagers trying to sneak into an 18 rated movie. It was the promise of queer stories, any queer stories on screen. Access to representation at the time was scarce and almost impossible to find in age appropriate shows beyond one off characters. So we watched Queer as Folk or bought DVDs from places like Peccadillo Pictures, where most movies seem to be about queer adults who ended up dying or alone. Edgy teen shows became all the rage and a generation became fixated on the likes of Maxie, Emily and Naomi from Skins or continued watching series like Glee long after they stopped actually enjoying it just to see Santana or Britney on screen. It's with the barren wasteland of my teen years in mind that I decided to make this video about Heartstopper, a new TV show based on a webcomic of the same name about a group of British teenagers figuring out love, life and friendship. At its centre is a friends to boyfriend's romance between anxiety-ridden Charlie and soft boy rugby lad Nick. Reviews have all centred around similar words, likeable, endearing, wholesome, earnest. It's an anti-cynical show in its approach. You have to dive in and embrace it like a kid who's too young to have been sucked into the shame-driven idea of cringe. There's a difference between sweet and surface level and Heartstopper is not the latter. I cannot overstate the importance of having queer media accessible for young teens, especially at a time when we have legislation appearing all over the world, trying to stop them even hearing about LGBTQ plus identities and experiences in schools and libraries. So many elements of the show feel fresh and exciting. When I say it's the future of LGBTQ plus teen media, it's not because I think that it's the be all and end all in queer teen rep, but it is showing us so many possibilities. We need to see more wholesome storylines, more teen shows with age ratings that mean that all teens can actually watch them, more majority queer casts of characters, more non-tragic queer romances, more teens playing teens, more trans teen characters, more adaptations that trust their queer creators with creative control, and having it be championed by the channel or streaming platform that it's on. There have been queer characters on teen shows for some years now, initially as minor or side characters, and then a small part of an ensemble, and then more recently, one or two have crept into lead roles. But Heartstopper is committed to giving us queerness across all its leads, and filling their lives ultimately with abundant joy. And that feels particularly special right now. I think it's pretty telling that when I first watched the show and clicked on the option for like suggestions, Netflix struggled to find proper matches. The closest it now recommends is Young Royals, but the others are mostly straight-centered teen shows or even totally random suggestions, including 18-rated shows just to fill space. There are, of course, other shows about teenagers that include queer characters out there, but a surprising amount like Euphoria, Sex Education, or Skins are age-restricted, so they aren't actually suitable for teens themselves, having 18-rated certificates in the UK. There are also a lot of queer movies that feature queer teen protagonists, but which are definitely made for an adult movie going audience in mind like Moonlight or Pariah. I do get that high age rated media can have a specific appeal for young viewers for that exact reason, but Charlie's 14 at the start of Heartstopper, and it's good to see media that specifically is about a queer kid that age that real life queer kids can actually watch. It isn't something shameful or illicit. And it isn't a side character in an ensemble show about an otherwise straight friend group, nor does it condescend to teens or present a kind of performative Disney channel style exaggeration. The background of the show. 
Heartstopper started life as a passion project, a webcomic about two side characters in Alice Oseman's novel Solitaire, not something that would make money and certainly not something that would become a bestseller with a Netflix adaptation. But the sweet and heartfelt story resonated with fans around the world and a Kickstarter to self-publish a physical copy of the first volume of the webcomic in 2018 raised over $25,000 in just 24 hours and over $70,000 across the entire campaign mainstream publishers took notice, and the following year, Hachette began publishing the webcomic in its entirety, starting with a reprint of the first volume. That same year, the comic was optioned by Seesaw Films to be developed into a TV series. I hosted the book launch for Volume 1 in London the same day that the deal got announced, and the energy at that event was electric. Everyone in the audience was buzzing, and the show wasn't even technically confirmed yet. Alice being brought on as the writer and showrunner has no doubt been a deciding factor in the show's success. The fans trust Alice, and with good reason. It's easy to see elements of the webcomic that makes it so special being sidelined by a more removed creative team. Team. The inherent Britishness of the setting, the sweet nature of the story, the authentic casting and majority LGBTQ plus main characters, for example. I can see a world in which a lot of that got whittled away to try and appeal to like a broader audience. As it is, Heartstopper provides a pretty unique look at queer TV that is both about and for teens. Alice has said in a recent interview, there's a lot on TV now that has queer content, but it's definitely for adults. A lot of queer stories are still very serious or focused on trauma. The experience of making the show seems to have been a seminal one for those involved. At the advanced screening of the first two episodes during the Q&A afterwards, Joe, who plays Charlie, was close to tears talking about the show. The cast called Alice and executive producer Patrick Walters their on-set mum and dad. Talking to members of the cast afterwards, there was this intense excitement and energy, already hoping to be able to get back for season two and explore their characters' stories even deeper. The show also had LGBTQ plus consultant Jeffrey Ingold alongside the queer members of the creative team and cast, including the director Eros Lynn. Ingolt has written about working with the cast and crew on creating an inclusive set and talking about what life is like for LGBTQ plus students today so they could bring that into their work on screen. If you forget to do your maths homework until the last minute like Nick, or want to make a watch list so you never run out of ideas for films for movie night like Tao, then you might be in need of today's sponsor, Notion, a sponsor that I contacted to ask to sponsor me because I use it every single day. It's a website and app that you can use to plan, organize, and collaborate on basically anything you want in your life. It's super flexible, so you can use it like a word processor, a to-do list tracker, a project manager, a mood board, either as your own private organizational world or with a whole team because everything can be connected and shared. My little ADHD brain uh, has struggled for a long time with like forgetting a task existed unless it was right in front of me. I'd start bullet journals and abandon them within a week. I would take notes on one notepad and then put it down somewhere random and then find it months later. It's hard to say organized when the info you need might be on a loose slip of paper or this random sticky note that your kittens managed to get hold of and chew up. Look, there's a reason I reached out to Notion about a sponsorship. I'd already been using it and loving how much it helped me and wanted to share that with all of you. Notion's essentially great for keeping all those random notes and to-do lists in one place with all the projects and pages visible at once and some extra functions added for good measure. I've been working with my lovely virtual assistant, Julia, to help organize my work schedule and deadlines Lines, and the databases in Notion let us put all of my tasks and meetings into a list, but that list can also be used as like a calendar, as a monthly to-do list, as a project task priority board, and they're all linked. So if I have to change a deadline on something, I can do it on one page and it automatically changes it everywhere else as well. I used to have like dozens of fan fiction tabs open at any one time, not to call myself out that I wanted to read, that's a Notion page now. Um, I would add recipes to like a bookmark folder that I literally never looked at. That's a cute Notion gallery now. I'd have like all travel or event information scattered through like different email apps. That's, you'd guessed it, a Notion page now. If you want to give Notion a try, you can sign up using the link in the description. It is totally free. And then please send me screen grabs of your Notion setup because honestly, being nosy about other people's setups is uh, very much a new hobby of mine at this point. The queer coming of age story. 
The traditional Bildungsroman genre, following the coming of age of a lead character, has been a focus of literary analysis for centuries, and part of this criticism has focused on the specific straight white male perspective, which dictated which milestone should be present in such a transformation from child to adult. Queer coming of age stories are having to build their own set of rites of passage, not necessarily the same as these traditional ones in more modern takes on the genre. Coming out, finding your community, experimenting with your self-expression are all pieces that might make up a queer buildings roman. But in acknowledging that there are a variety of experiences across all teens, we also have to acknowledge that there is a variety even within the queer community. And that's something that Heartstopper gives us at its core. We have Charlie, Nick, Darcy, Tara and Elle all confirmed as being part of the LGBTQ plus community by the end of season one, with Alice hinting at a possible Arrow A storyline for Isaac next season. By giving us this spread of queerness, we are allowed to focus on different experiences and views of coming out and being comfortable with your identity. In a rare departure from the source material, the TV show strays from the tighter focus on Nick and Charlie that the webcomic gives us to dive deeper into scenes in the girls' school, as well as moments between other characters with neither Nick or Charlie present. In doing so, we get a real ensemble feel, fleshing out the central romance while giving space for the unique experiences of all of the leads. A tall order in just eight 30 minute episodes, but somehow it works. This allows the show to give us Charlie, Elle and Darcy, three characters characters who have already been on their journeys of identity and discovery and are out publicly, while also showing like Nick, Ben and Tara who aren't out and are at various stages of figuring out how they fit into the LGBTQ plus community if at all. We can have a queer villain and it isn't the only representation that we get. The fact that Ben has a girlfriend doesn't become a suggestion that, you know, bi people are inherently unfaithful or secretly actually gay or straight because we also see Nick as a canonical bi character who is none of those things. And Nick is allowed to be on a full journey from seemingly totally unquestioning at the start to yelling about his boyfriend in the final episode. He spends a lot of the show confused and stressed and searching for answers to these questions that Charlie is sparking. It shows that in fact, not knowing can be just as difficult as knowing your sexuality as a teenager, that the internal struggle is just as valid as the external ones. By episode three, Nick clearly knows that he likes Charlie Charlie, but that's about as far as he's gotten. When Charlie asks him, would you kiss someone who wasn't a girl? He says, I don't know. But when he asks, would you kiss me? His answer is yes. The stereotypical idea of like, fancy boys and girls in a hypothetical way, realize your sexuality, come out, have a relationship in that order is not the only valid path. Just because you don't have a word to describe the whole of your capacity for attraction doesn't mean what you feel for an individual can't be real and important. Nick saying, I've been so, so confused. I think I just need time to figure this out. Doesn't end with his running off and ignoring Charlie. Instead, hugging him and letting himself be emotionally vulnerable because their relationship is built on the kind of friendship that makes Charlie the perfect person to go to for comfort or to talk things through. Right after Nick asks Charlie if he's okay with him not being out at school and keeping their relationship a secret there and Charlie agrees. But in an important change to Ben's forced secrecy, Nick not only lets Charlie kiss him outside his house where no one from school will know, but leaves the interaction smiling to himself. And when they see each other again at school, they are essentially still making moon eyes at each other, with Charlie walking into the classroom already grinning because he knows this won't be like it was with Ben, with Nick ignoring or insulting him. One review of the show that I read from Jack King over at GQ was critical of the show having coming out stories in it at all, saying, it's prudent moving forwards to consider how else we can imagine queer lives and experiences on screen, to think about the myriad queer stories that have nothing to do with coming out, a process increasingly considered outdated, especially as sexual categories continue to dissolve. But I have to disagree. I think that the call from adults to stop coming out stories is a song I've been hearing for years, but still queer youth continue to crave and celebrate these stories when they're given them. We have two LGBTQ plus characters coming out in the first season of this show, but we also have at least four who are already out and have their own stories outside of that. It doesn't have to be a one or the other proposition, either across the industry or within a single piece of media. Coming out changes and evolves as an experience. The methods that young and older people are using now to come out to their families, friends, and peers are different to those that even existed when I was a teenager. 
The idea that sexual categories are dissolving and removing the need to come out feels like a disservice to those who find community and confidence within a certain identity and word to define themselves. There is a huge power in being able to say, I am a lesbian, as much as there is in being able to say, I don't want to define myself or label my sexuality. When Nick confesses in a kind of roundabout way that he feels like his real personality has been buried inside of him, we can see coming out as more than just discovering your sexuality, but also figuring out all the ways that you've been pretending and performing for others. It's an internal process as much as an external verbalization. And sometimes the internal process is even more difficult than the public coming out element, which we see in the show with Nick's own confusion compared to Charlie's simple, well, it's always been boys. And then once you're ready to come out to one person, it doesn't mean that you'll be, you know, ready to come out to everyone. It's not like Nick figures out he likes Charlie and then boom, done, that's who he is, ready to come out. He comes out to certain individuals, one little step at a time in different ways to match his own comfort levels. Even with the characters who are already out, we see then messy comp- complexities, Darcy having been out for years and being super confident, joking about coming to the rugby match to meet the other local gays, in comparison to Charlie's insecurities and anxieties stemming from his own forced outing. Even though they are in a supportive relationship, Tara still feels that she knows nothing in comparison to Darcy, telling her, I just want to live my life. They have different relationships to their own identity and what it means to them. The show gives us representation of individual queer identities without relying on cliches. In fact, they often specifically avoid them. Trans viewers seem to have overwhelmingly praised the way that Elle's storyline balances the line between not erasing or hiding her experience as a trans girl, but not having it be the entire focus of the story either. Her conflict is being the new girl at school and not knowing how to make friends, a worry that is ultimately unrelated to her being trans, other than it being the reason why she's had to move schools in the middle of the year in the first place. There's a mention of dead naming and bullies, but other than that, Elle is just a girl with crushes and insecurities around finding new friends at a new school. Like they don't allow the camera to linger on her looking sadly at herself in the mirror as she puts on makeup or panning across family photos of her before she transitioned or any other myriad like tragic trans story beats that we see so often on screen. She and Tao haven't quite entered into a romantic relationship at the end of the first season, but even viewers new to these characters can see that it's only a matter of time. We also have incredible lesbian rep on the show with the characters unapologetically using the word itself, lesbian, which young people even today have talked about feeling nervous to call themselves in social media posts and TikToks, including in response to this show. The specific Specific experiences of lesbianism, of being cut off from the idea of what makes a woman, of what should make them happy, of the idea that they are valued at least in part by their potential relationship to men or lack of, it's a difficult thing for some people to come to terms with even within themselves. And then there's other people's responses. As someone who went to an all-girls school, the specific type of bullying that Tara and Darcy endure hit pretty close to home this relentless and unchecked verbal and emotional harassment, that feeling of ostracization that comes from being the source of whispers and stares, it's seemingly more subtle and low level compared to the brawls and posturing of the boys' school, but it's just as impactful in its insidious nature. By giving us two girls in the same school, each having different personal experiences of their own shared identity, we can see how it isn't just a case of coming out as simple, look, Darcy already did it. And of course, there is the bi rep in the show in the form of Nick Nelson, followed at all times by excellent bisexual lighting and attracted to everyone in Pirates of the Caribbean, truly a bi con. Nick doesn't feel fully at ease in this super heteronormative world of his friendship group and his hobbies, but he has this super heterosexual label put on him, even by characters like Elle and Tao, who are sympathetic in the audience's eyes, showing us that even well-meaning people can fall into assumptions based on nothing but stereotypes. There's some very like clear visual indicators of the way that Nick feels kind of pulled between these two different worlds. Like at the rugby match, he literally is in the middle of the screen and there's two groups either side of him when he's trying to figure out like who he is and where he belongs. Nick Googling, am I gay? And taking a quiz on it is like peak, oh no, what is going on with me behavior? A lot of people have interpreted him crying when he sees the result of the quiz as him realizing that he isn't straight. But I think it's specifically that the result is inconclusive. He hasn't been given the reassurance of a 0% or 100%. He's got 62%. So where the hell does that leave him? And it's quickly followed by web pages about hate crimes and opposition to marriage equality and conversion therapy. It's this depressingly realistic impression of the kind of thing that awaits queer kids when they're forced to go searching for their own answers. I think it's something that's relatable to a lot of queer people generally, but also has these particular moments that will resonate with bisexual 
single viewers in particular. And we do see some positives too, like a coming out video about bisexuality that clearly resonates with Nick. And it really hammers home the importance of representation that's accessible across all ages. When he opens up and admits, I've been researching about being bisexual, I think that might be me, but I'm not sure. We have this great sense that coming out doesn't have to be this definitive one-time certainty. You don't have to go it alone until you work yourself out before you communicate with everyone around you like a big announcement. You can be unsure, ask for input, share your feelings. In fact, it might just be a vital way to get through the process. The show also goes out of its way to show the differences between the behavior of two closeted, potentially bisexual characters, Nick and Ben. It means that their behavior and attitudes are not made indicative of their sexuality, but are simply part of their own individual stories and personalities. It also stops being in the closet from being inherently linked to villainy or inauthenticity. This extremely tedious cliche of like, oh, the homophobic bully is always secretly gay themselves, which I think lets a lot of like, you know, the majority of gay bullies who are just mean heterosexuals off the hook. The range of queer characters allows us to see people at different stages of their journey and means that we aren't given a supposedly universal experience just because they're in the same school or environment. Nick deals with homophobia by calling it out, not getting violent or defensive in comparison to Ben dealing with it badly and hurting others. Having multiple closeted and questioning characters allows that to be a possibility. It shows a positive way to handle it, but also the negativity it can bring out in victims themselves. There's something deeply tragic in Ben's story. When he tells Charlie, as if anyone would ever want to go out with someone as desperate as you, you actually thought I liked you. I just felt sorry for you. We can see how much he's fronting, lashing out, how much ultimately he hates himself. When Charlie confronts him in a blink and you'll miss it moment, you can see that Ben actually starts to cry. It doesn't excuse his actions, but it does go some way to explaining the toxic behaviors and why they're flaring up again and again for him. And it shows us that building a more accepting world won't just help the characters like Charlie, but also potentially stop this kind of toxicity in characters like Ben as well. When Nick tells Charlie, let's keep this a secret in school, it could easily have been portrayed as a character flaw. Oh, okay, so this is his moment where he becomes just like Ben, but where Ben didn't even want to acknowledge he knew Charlie at school, Nick is happy to essentially stay the same around him in front of others, just as friendly and affectionate. Just because someone isn't ready to come out doesn't automatically mean that they're a bad person at all. But we also see what homophobia and fear and peer pressure can do to even the nicest of people. Nick is so scared and pressured that he ends up agreeing to a date with Imogen, knowing that he doesn't actually like her. He doesn't go through with the date itself, but feeling forced to lie about himself has the potential to hurt others in the way that encourages him to live the pretense in practice, not just in words, to prove something to others around him. But we also get Nick as an active participant in his and Charlie's blossoming romance. It isn't at all one-sided. It's Nick that suggests that they share a milkshake in front of the others and that they should come out to Elle. In contrast, Ben only engages with Charlie in an active way when he needs something from him or wants to use him in private. Nick, of course, essentially comes out in this big dramatic, like run off the rugby pitch moment and more specifically to his mum at the end of the season, but it isn't portrayed as something that he has to do to be himself. It isn't a moral imperative. It's just something that will make him personally more happy at that particular moment. Friendship. Friendship is at the very heart of the show. From Elle's nerves about finding friends at a new school, to Charlie and Nick becoming friends before they get together, to Nick deciding to cut out the toxic friends from his life. This focus on friendship isn't an afterthought. Alice themselves saying, I think it's really important to stress the importance of friendships in teen stories because in reality, they don't usually meet the love of their life in their teens. And the most important relationships in the lives of teens are friendships. Heartstopper doesn't just tell us these characters are friends. It shows us in the fast moving group chats, the lunchtime rituals, the gentle British teasing, and in the negatives too, in the pressure that Nick feels to conform to a group, even if he thinks they're in the wrong, in the jealousy of Tal, so clearly underscored by genuine care and worry, for a friend that he saw bullied last year by the same type of boy who is now apparently disrupting their group dynamic. At the heart of it, a lot of these worries of Elle, Nick, Tao stem from the fear of being alone. So it's particularly exciting to see the idea of queer friendships as being front and center, 
Tara comes out to Nick at the party feeling like she can trust him and he ends up doing the same for her. When Nick sees Tara and Darcy publicly and unashamed for the first time, his smile is like radiant. He is so happy for their joy together. It isn't tinged with a destructive jealousy of a closeted character wishing that they could be out so they insult or demean those that are. We see Elle befriending the school lesbians and I know a lot of young people will particularly appreciate this dynamic with the co-opting of lesbian issues by transphobes in the UK in recent years especially. We see allyship within the community as well as outside of it, with characters supporting each other against different identities and experiences. It also leaves Tao as the only sort of token cis straight friend of the main group and having him fit into this friendship group with zero drama or complications due to his sexuality is so refreshing. And honestly, it's not unrealistic, especially the self-aware way he talks about himself as being like the token of the group. His allyship is a vital component of the spectrum of cis and straight side characters' reactions to queerness, from Harry's laddish homophobia to Imogen's somewhat ignorant eagerness. Queer kids and their friends also need to see that they're not alone in their peer groups, that their communities and support networks can also include those who aren't LGBTQ plus themselves. His budding relationship with trans girl Elle as a straight boy without any kind of sexuality crisis is a brilliant, subtle way of portraying Elle as just as much of a girl as Tara and Darcy, especially as Tao has known Elle since before she transitioned. She's desirable without being fetishized, and the worries about them getting together are tied to the classic ideas of like not wanting to change or risk a strong friendship rather than her being trans. Romance. Queerness has long been overtly sexualized, from the equation of like lesbian with a porn category to the idea that openly gay teachers are dangerous in schools, giving young people a view of queer romance and tenderness outside of that sexualization is so important. There's nothing more or less scandalous or inappropriate about queer teens being interested in sex than straight teens being the same, but there's also nothing wrong with giving them access to the romantic ideas from love stories that they've been missing either. And I think that in doing work to destigmatize queer sex, we shouldn't leave the romance element behind. The show is full of these relatable moments of like feeling the electric rush of hoping to hold hands or lying beside your crush on a snowy day or wanting to throw your phone across the room because you sent them a message and they haven't replied yet and you're like, did I say the wrong thing? They use the original Heartstopper illustrations to help with that, to give a visual to the internal feeling of hope and yearning and butterflies. We get the classic kiss in the rain, the cute nicknames, the holding each other's hand for comfort while watching a scary movie. These kind of classic romantic movie tropes, mostly reserved for straight characters in the past. And more than that, Nick and Charlie have a genuinely healthy and communicative relationship. They're always checking in with each other and telling the other how they're feeling. Charlie wants to make sure that Nick isn't feeling pressured to come out and Nick apologizes for any negative feelings that Charlie might have from keeping the distance between them and not being ready for a public relationship. The very fact that Nick is even aware of what Charlie might be feeling in comparison to his previous relationship with Ben is part of why not being out in their relationship is initially just not a big deal for Charlie because he knows that this is different and especially because we know that he himself was not ready to come out when he was outed. But we also have the idea that sometimes you can like or even love each other but circumstances still make that difficult. Charlie might be okay with Nick not being out and understand why, but he's still allowed to want the freedom to be open with Nick and that's neither of their faults. Alice has said in a recent interview, I wanted Charlie to just be supportive the whole time. There's no drama at all around Nick not being able to figure out what his sexuality is. Charlie's very happy to just let him have the time and space to figure out who he is, and that's really important. We also have the adorable existing relationship between girlfriends Tara and Darcy, and how they exemplify a kind of opposites attract energy, but always are there for each other. They're allowed to be physically affectionate without being sexualized, plus the blossoming romance between Elle and Tao, making a great remedy to the cliches of like insta-love or straight characters who hate each other until they're suddenly in love, because they're like, amazing friends first. It gives us these three couples who are just as much friends as they are romantic partners. And that feels like a really kind of fun and healthy model to be giving to young people. Teens play by teens. There's something that feels weirdly refreshing about the ages of the lead actors in this show. They're all a lot closer to the ages of their characters than we're used to seeing, with so many teen characters on TV being played by old actors in their 20s. Literally, the actors Joe and Kit, who play Nick and Charlie, told us at the advanced screening that they're about to do their A-levels, which is so wild. I think it means that the giddy crushes and frustrated outbursts of these characters feel more organic, because like, yeah, that's what teenagers are like. The show's full of relatable British teen experience 
experiences, especially for queer teens. Charlie's gay panic phone background, the idea of like Nando's and cinema being the obvious ultimate date choice, Darcy saying any minor inconvenience is homophobia, the awkward way that Charlie tells Nick, like, you don't have to come, you probably have way more interesting things to do before even letting Nick reply. Even their inability to see their parents, seeing through all their bullshit, like Nick's mum saying things like, Charlie's a really special friend, isn't he? Like, that's a hint, Nicholas, that you are not picking up on. The actors Yaz and Will, who play Elle and Tao, specifically commented in the screening Q&A how incredible it was to see the specific breakdown of their character in the casting call, something that they hadn't really seen before. Like East Asian teenager, trans girl of color, these breakdowns are specified and like requirements are still really rare in the industry. I read a review the other day from Metro reviewer Rebecca Nicholson that I think kind of misses this appeal of the series. She says, I'm not quite sure who the target audience is. It certainly feels aimed at a young crowd. And if teenagers are watching Euphoria now, then this feels more like a throwback to Biker Grove slash Grange Hill days. There are double dates with milkshakes and lots of meaningful hugs. The idea being that shows like Euphoria being made has fundamentally either revealed or changed teenage to require a show about their lives to be gritty and sexual and full of suffering. But I don't think that's the case at all. Viewers of any age, but especially queer viewers, are totally valid in wanting wholesome and sweet stories or a mix of styles and tones to reflect their experiences across different shows. And this kind of innocent sweetness is exactly the appeal for a lot of Heartstopper viewers. Avoiding trauma and rejection storylines. Heartstopper avoids some of the most common traumatic queer tropes out there. There's no gay bashing, no bury your gaze trope, no family rejection. I think there's a balance to be struck across the film and TV industry, knowing that there are kids who do go through these things, but on balance, the non-tragic portrayals are still much more rare. So giving us a show that avoids the worst of it, but is still sensitive in the portrayal of struggles that it does depict, feels like a much needed addition to the queer representation landscape. For example, we get to see a cast of universally supportive adults in the show. Of course, we have Nick's Oscar-winning mother dropping these sweet little hints like, oh, you seem more yourself around him. He's very different to your other friends, giving Nick the space to come to her if he wants to say anything. There's also Charlie's dad wanting to protect him from bullies and Tao's mum totally unfazed by Elle's transition, embarrassing Tao by telling him to like keep the door open, just as she would if he brought home any girl he might fancy. There's also Mr. Ajayi, the art teacher with his like little pride badge at work and being a safe person for Charlie to open up to about bullying and boy troubles. For those who love him as much as I do, you'll be pleased to know that he has a love interest in the books who hopefully will be making an appearance in season two. There's something really special about this kind of adult safety net around the gentle turmoil of these young people's lives. They have support waiting in the wings in a way that tells viewers, hey, like, don't worry, this is gonna be okay in the end. They have places they can go to feel safe. Those with real adult power over them, their guardians and teachers are not going to abuse that power. Heartstopper doesn't shy away from difficult topics and tough teenage experiences. The webcomic and Nick and Charlie novellas include things like parties, drinking and sex, but always in an age appropriate way. In the show, for example, we do see the forced kiss between Charlie and Ben on screen, but it isn't gratuitous and is treated with seriousness in the moment and afterwards that it deserves. It's emphasized that Nick is able to be there as a friend, not just as like a gallant defender of Charlie's honor or a jealous boyfriend, with the way that they discuss how Charlie is feeling about it afterwards. We start the story at the end of the Ben and Charlie relationship. It's not something that's like dragged out torturously through the entire show. Mental health issues are a huge part of Charlie's storyline through the webcom as well as the novel where his character originally appeared, Solitaire, told from his sister Tori's point of view. Alice has talked before about wanting to give Heartstopper a lighter tone to the original novel, but also knowing that she needed to include these elements in the story too. I don't want to give away big spoilers for those who have only watched the show, so we'll be talking here specifically about elements that have been included in the foreground and more subtly in the TV series itself only, rather than things that happen later on within the comics. We of course have Charlie's anxiety, which comes through in things like his constant need to apologise, his history of self-isolation, uh, the dark pulsing lighting surrounding imagined scenarios in his head of Nick being disgusted by him. 
He blames himself for everything that goes wrong, telling Nick, I've been making your life really difficult and it's all my fault after Nick punches Harry. We also see the effects it has on those around him, Tao's overprotectiveness, his father's strained worry, and of course we have the scene between him and Tori towards the end of season one. Maybe I do just ruin people's lives, he tells her. Maybe it will be better if I didn't exist. This anxiety also manifests in Charlie's relationship with food. Although it hasn't been mentioned outright, we see hints across the show. Charlie brushes off the offer of popcorn from Nick when he's confronted with the stress of being around both Ben and Harry at the cinema. He stares blankly at a full bowl of cereal, but we never see him take a spoonful. He tells Tori he isn't hungry after breaking down in front of her. He goes to eat in the classroom at lunch, but closes his lunchbox back up before he can take a bite. Heartstopper is setting up for season two and beyond a depiction of mental health issues in much the same way it does to the graphic novel. Something serious, but not sensationalized. We know we won't be getting any like graphic 13 reasons why style scenes and that the focus is on healthy recovery and realistic setbacks rather than melodrama. Because the sad reality is that mental health and eating disorders are issues that disproportionately affect the queer community, including gay teens like Charlie in real life. A lot of people love Heartstopper for its wholesome qualities, but I think season two will bring us an interesting balance between misery porn and bubblegum fluff to show the possibilities of happy endings even when dealing with real life problems. And these real life problems also include both like homophobia and transphobia in the show, indicative sadly of the British high school setting. We see the impact it has on Tara especially in the show with comments on her coming out Instagram post like what a waste, girls whispering lesbians are so disgusting during orchestra practice and hearing other students say things like don't look at her you'll catch the lesbian disease. These are all pretty much verbatim things that I heard when I was a teenager and afterwards too. Even well-meaning comments like the girl who says I never would have guessed you were gay but you're really brave reflect the ignorance and prejudice against lesbians and our experiences. The statistics Statistics on homophobic bullying in UK schools are stark, but they're slowly getting better. In 2007, 65% of LGB students reported experiencing bullying because of their sexuality, which was down to 55% in 2012 and 45% in the most recent studies. This, however, did include those still in the closet when no one knew their sexuality. And another study also found that just 27% of secondary school students believe it would be safe to come out in their schools. Research in 2019 found that anti-LGBTQ plus bullying was the most common kind of bullying found in schools and that three quarters of teachers had witnessed it. We see in the show the downtrodden attitude of characters like Charlie, out of the previous school year and resigned to his treatment. I'm honestly used to it by now, he says. It takes Nick to come into the situation from the outside to give him some perspective. When Charlie excuses Nick's friend's behavior with some of the rugby lads are nice, Nick shakes it off. Even they just stood there, he says. Not actually harassing people isn't enough. Yes, Harry using the F slur is markedly awful, but what does it say about someone if they just let that slide or laugh in the background? And not just the out and out insults, but the plausible deniability of implied insults too. When Harry asks, what's it like being gay? He acts like it's an innocent question because he isn't just asking. He isn't genuinely interested in Charlie's experiences for anything other than fuel for his harassment. I think that anyone who has been bullied can recognize these kind of subtle mind games. Things where if you were to just repeat it back to a teacher or a, a point of authority, wouldn't seem that bad, especially if you're in a situation where adults are not particularly supportive of LGBTQ plus people anyway. It gives them the opportunity to brush it off as well. We see the impact of this kind of bullying and how scared Charlie is after he and Nick share their first kiss, apologizing for kissing Nick in a panicked rush, not even being able to look at him. He's expecting rejection and potentially retaliation, Charlie is constantly apologizing for being clingy and annoying, something we assume he picked up from Ben's treatment of him, something he's learned to internalize about himself. When his dad tells him, if any of those boys says anything nasty, you just call me, we know it's from his past experience. I also think it's really powerful that the message here about bullying strays away from like those cliches that we get told a lot in school, right? Just ignore the bully. Just ignore the bully, that'll solve the problem. Because I think that anyone who's been bullied knows that it never does. Like, I think this kind of advice is exactly what leads Charlie to be in the position that he's in within the show where he's kind of just resigned to it. And I like the idea that one of the triumphant moments for his character is letting himself feel anger. It's letting himself feel how unfairly he's been treated because it kind of shows the 
increase that he has in his self-worth and his self-esteem by the end when he confronts Ben. Saying just ignore them is a very easy way, I think, for people in positions of authority around kind of teenagers and kids, or even later in adulthood in the workplace, things like that, from being absolved of like actually trying to stop the bullying happening at all, right? It's like, I don't have to do anything to stop this because the issue is with you who is being bullied. If you can just be the bigger person, ignore it, just let it wash over you, just, uh, you know, listen to it every day, but just don't let it affect you. Like, that'll be fine. Cinematography. Translating the webcomic into a visual medium like TV had the potential to disappoint. The original has such a strong sense of its own style, so there was always going to be a risk that it would lose something in the transition. But instead, the show manages to evoke the framing and panels of the comic while adding its own flair with an incredible soundtrack and visual energy. Wolf Alice, Girl in Red, Orla Gartland, Maggie Rogers, Baby Queen all lend their talents to a sweet and emotive sound across each episode. And I, for one, would be very into a Heartstopper concert featuring these artists because it is all I've been listening to for the last week so you know please get on that Netflix. The show has this mix of like way too real British school vibes with pops of fantasy not just the literal comic illustrations but also like quintessential gaming arcades and pop-up milkshake trucks and picturesque snowscapes a sense of relatability and also permission to romanticize a queer childhood. Literally just before I started filming this, I was like scrolling through TikTok and saw an interview with Yaz who plays Elle talking about this as being like a fantasy story. Like it's very, very close to what she herself experienced. It like runs very parallel, the idea of like being punished in school for your hair being too long and having to move schools. But she said like she had to move due to bullying. Elle got to move just because she's a girl so she didn't belong in a boys school like it was something that was a positive part of her transition in a lot of ways the visual language of the comics appears in the white borders separating scenes the murals designed by alice in the background the framing of shots matching exactly to the corresponding original scenes images of nature are all across the show blossoming flowers electric lightning sparks beautiful colored leaves of change i know it's the english student in me but there's something that feels very validating about natural imagery being used to surround a relationship that so many of us will have heard being called unnatural in our lives. And the show also adds colour and lighting in a beautiful way, giving us, you know, bisexual flag colours washing over Nick in multiple scenes and flashes of rainbow behind Tara and Darcy's first public kiss. It's not subtle, but also there's a joy in it being so proudly displayed in such an unambiguous way. Audience response. The show has been incredibly popular. Every other TikTok I see is people talking about it or having Chen to envy over Kit Connor or relating hard to Isaac's bookworm vibes. Viewers new to the book have sold out the graphic novels and novellas at a rate of knots both in store and online. It's topping bestseller charts all over the place. Like honestly, I think one of my biggest flexes right now is the fact that I own a copy of the Nick and Charlie novella I have for a few years because there are so many people who are new to the show who are trying to get their hands on this. And I heard somewhere that it's like, weeks, maybe even months before they're going to be able to get it. It's all out of stock everywhere. When I tell you the energy in the advanced screening was incredible. Like that room was full of queer people. Like it was all queer creatives, queer influencers, queer journalists and writers. It was amazing. We all were sharing in these moments of like relatability, in the moments of like awkwardness, in the moments of joy all together. And hearing other people have the same reaction that you are having just felt so special. But I also think here is a really important place to talk about the response from many adult viewers, because I think it's very reflective of a lack of equivalent representation when we were younger. Digital spy critic David Opie explains, it's uncanny really, like a window into the teen years I could have maybe enjoyed if I had just been born a couple of decades later. There was nothing out there like Heartstopper to affirm queerness as something you could actually be proud of. For a lot of us, it fills our hearts with such joy for teen queer viewers to be able to see this at their age, to see the possibility of happiness, to hear parent and teacher characters be endlessly supportive, and not just that they can see this on screen, but that they might feel able to celebrate it with their own peers, to share their excitement about the show with their friends, and maybe their own heart-stopping romances in a way so many of us were unable to comprehend at their age. But there's also a darker side to the show's response. Nick's line to Charlie, I wish I could have met you sooner, is apt here. A lot of adult viewers have spoken about a real feeling of mourning or sadness, even jealousy, for a childhood and teenage experience that they'll never have the tragedy of seeing what you missed out on. 
I spoke to my older brother about this, he's gay and in his 40s, and we both had this sense of longing and melancholy around the series. In a way, it highlighted an experience that we never got to have. This is something that more and more people have since been talking about online. I've seen a lot of adults on Twitter, for example, talking about it, but I think it's also important to note that a lot of young queer people are feeling a very similar way. There have been some really heartbreaking responses to Heartstopper from teen queer fans who love the show, but have also found it overwhelming them with the realization that they won't get to experience teen romance themselves knowing it gets better you know hypothetically but not being there yet like there's a lot of older queer people who are feeling like oh I wish that I could have had it sooner like I wish that I could have experienced like the love with my partner that I currently have when I was younger I wish that I hadn't had to have the experience of my teens in my 20s or even later like those are all things that we're feeling but a lot of queer teenagers who are not in some kind of utopian queer space right they're not in a high school that accepts them maybe they're the only like queer person out of their school they're aware of the fact that they are not going to get to experience that but they also aren't in a place of like adulthood and freedom where they can find it for themselves yet a lot of these young people don't see this kind of joyful happiness and romance as something that they have access to right now either we've come a long way since i was a teenager you know sneaking around trying to watch queer as folk because it was the only thing that i could find but there's still some way to go i think that having like open and honest conversations about queerness across teenage lives in the classroom at home in their media is only going to help that having comprehensive queer education and anti-bullying policies having queer youth groups available outside of school having these kind of support networks set up like all of this stuff is only going to help ultimately and i think that's one of the reasons why it's so horrendous that there are moves not just to stop these kind of extras from happening but actively going backwards to be banning books to be banning these discussions in the end it's not going to help anyone in fact it's going to do a huge amount of damage as of me recording this we don't have a season two confirmation from netflix yet but the viewing figures pretty much guarantee that one will happen. But more than that, they should guarantee shows outside of this one specific special series get commissioned, greenlit and adapted. Ones that give us this wholesome, sweet, happy ending for other queer kids on screen. Ones that explore other identities and experiences. Ones which cross into different genres, but that have at their heart this feeling of being seen and understood and celebrated that so many young people are finding so joyous about Heartstopper. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any thoughts on the show or the topics that I've covered in this video, then please leave them in the comments. Thank you again to Notion for sponsoring this video. I will leave the link to sign up in the description, along with uh, the link to my book and my Patreon if you would like to help support my work and also my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.